I'm really happy to be here. It's, uh, as I said, a whole lot more complicated than Zoom conferences. <laughs> um, it's fascinating to see such a big team uh, working on this and really delightful to be in person. Um, so I'll start and uh, hopefully this works. I wanted to start by thanking my team at Pentagram. Uh, some of them have been with me for 12 years, 10 years, six years, and uh, I get a lot of support from them. I want to begin, we're called internally the JAM team, so that's my little typographic graffiti shout out to the team. Um, as Mike said, um, I wanted to talk about this uh, recent study from Monotype uh, that was published just a few weeks ago. Um, about the emotional impact of typography. When I saw this, I thought, you know, I have a lot of emotions about type. I think everybody in the room has this kind of weirdly physical reaction. Um, and so they got my attention right away. Um, the study, they said, the goal was to uh, see how type drives experiences, associations, feelings, and assess the effectiveness of type in different situations. So working with a neuroscience company, uh, a multiple choice, choice test was conducted online with 400 people between the ages of 18 and 50. The test used keywords such as quality, trust, and innovation in three different fonts, shown with coordinated taglines and logos. And you saw that sexy video about Cotford uh, just before the conference. Um, the fonts were selected to represent different sectors. The humanist uh, sans FS Jack would represent banking and finance. The geometric sans Gilroy would represent technology. And the display serif Cotford would represent fashion and luxury. So while the study was ostensibly about the emotional qualities of type, I found it interesting that it also highlighted, in a way, how these stylistic conventions arise. And Monotype's trends report does a really beautiful job, similarly, of just tracking how fonts become signifiers of whole industries. As uh, Monotype's Phil Garnham asked, why do we use serifs in fashion brands, humanist fonts in financial brands, and geometrics in digital startups? These conventions are arguably the primary way in which type becomes communicative to audiences. Consumers have intuitive associations about type because, like Pavlov's dog, they have repeated exposure to the use of font these fonts in these sectors. As designers, we make choices about type within the same environment. Our choices simultaneously reinforce and push against these orthodoxies. It's a delicate dance for brands to look both right within their category, but also to be distinctive. As consumers, our eyes have an appetite for the assurances that come from understanding the signals and a restlessness to see something different. With new brands, the issue of category recognition intersects with the need to signal newness. Um, and uh, with new brands, this is sort of uh, fascinating. It's sort of like there's this additional need to also signal that something is new, so it's a new way of banking, a new approach to healthcare, a new software platform, and so on. And with so many product paradigms and services around wellness and personal care, there's this really strange blurring that occurs um, among these categories, and it starts to blend into this sort of amorphous category of newness. Is it a drug, a dating platform, is it underwear? Um, I kind of find myself lost a little bit in, the land, in this sort of consumer landscape, kind of guessing what that might, product might be. But typographic style is not really a detachable attribute. It's always mediated by context. Words and type form a kind of signifying bond. The word matters, the font matters, and the context matters a lot. Um, so just as an example, I have this little typographic word type relationship, um, maybe passive aggressive. <laughs> um, but my point is that the nuance of this or the irony or however you might interpret it completely changes according to the context. So when you say fuck you to your lawyer versus your client versus your wife um, <laughs> has a different impact. Um, so I think what the, um, the monotype 
sort of investigation was intriguing because it's really talking about the emotional shading of typography, its voice. Um, and that's really what the, the point was. But what occurred to me is that trust, innovation, and quality are not especially emotional. <laughs> um, and uh, maybe you could call them business emotions. Um, and that's not surprising that that might be the focus of, of such a study. Um, but I wanted to ask, what if we use different words? Um, one, words that are more emotional, that relate more to voice, um, and kind of have this uh, more hyperbolic quality. So I wanted to show some recent projects that, to me, kind of touch on some of those other qualities of voice in type. And I'd like to show, you know, the projects that I think have type playing a really central role. And I think about um, type playing a role because it's parallel to the way a director searches for the right actor to play a character. It's to invert the title of the famous play by Pirandello, the process could be described as an author in search of six characters. And just as actors are said to inhabit a role, design for me is often about inhabiting a typeface, performing in it and through it. I think that's true of, of many people in this audience. So the voice of typography operates a little bit like a ventriloquist dummy. <laughs> Have a couple layered metaphors here. We operate the puppet and feed it the lines. The more the puppet seems to be at odds with the ventriloquist, whether it's rude or subversive or goofy, the more uncanny the effect. But if you're thinking, wait a minute, Abbott, graphic designers are rarely theater people. Um, you're absolutely right. I think we're much closer to mimes. Um, <laughs> so uh, I want to start and define a few of these words and then uh, look at some projects. Um, first of all. Histrionic. A little verbal support. Um, so overly theatrical and melodramatic might seem far from the world of libraries, but not if the library is devoted to Shakespeare. Um, the Folger Shakespeare Library opened in Washington, D.C. in 1932 as a, as a center for the study of Renaissance literature and culture. Uh, the building was designed by Paul Cray. Um, and like the weird time warp that you have in Cooper Union between the exterior and the modernist interior, the Folger is Art Deco on the outside and Elizabethan on the inside. Um, very weird. Um, I was first involved with the Folger when I designed an exhibition about the life of Shakespeare in 2016. And now the library is undergoing a major expansion and will reopen next fall with new exhibition spaces and new signage and a new visual identity. Um, and our goal in, do this is the old identity on the bottom, but our goal was to really distinguish the Folger um, by really insisting on its identity as a contemporary institution serving contemporary audiences. There's a lot of that sort of PBS humanism <laughs> in Washington, D.C., and really wanted to sort of articulate that this is a, a modern place for sort of modern audiences. There's an incredible array of sort of typographic inspiration at the Folger in the building, on the building, in the collection. And we started by just surveying all of this material and I really love this sculpture in the, uh, there's a fountain outside, and this will actually be moved later to right next to the entrance. But it had this beautiful inscription, uh, Lord, what fools these mortal, mortals be, from uh, the character Puck from A Midsummer Night's Dream. And I was really drawn to that. This, the sculpture was designed by uh, a sculptor named Brenda Putnam. And she did this book called The Sculptor's Way, and she really is quite attentive to the role of lettering in sculpture. Um, this is her, this is the artist. You can see that there's clearly connections between the lettering of her sculptures and, and uh, the, the forms themselves. And what was so beautiful to me about this font was that, or this lettering, was that it sort of had this um, magnification of the character of the building, kind of monumental, modern, and really different from kind of the classic sort of humanities vibe in a lot of the other material. And so we sort of really looked at that closely and isolated that great F within the word fools and kind of made that our hero for the Folger. Um, and we started to refer to this as sort of Tudor deco as a style. 
Um, and this is the final mark. We paired it with the typeface Mallory by Tobias Freer Jones, a really beautiful font that he describes as kind of a combination of uh, American and British tendencies in lettering and typography. And then this is, there's a lot of different lockups. We've been kind of rolling out this system within the Folger um, over the last several months. Um, everything I'm showing you are really pandemic projects, which is interesting um, to work with uh, institutions in this climate. Uh, and just some samples of how it looks and how it behaves in the system. That's a real tote bag that I managed to make look totally fake. <laughs> it's <was> actually real. <laughs> um, I was so mad about the boots the guy was wearing, <laughs> I had to sort of alter it slightly. Um, the other cool thing about the Folger is that it has an Elizabethan theater tucked inside of it. And we had always argued that the, the theater should have a slightly different voice related. But you know, we were so enamored of this uh, puck lettering and wanted to somehow make more of it. So we found that Mallory was already pretty close to puck. Um, and that this, um, when I, I asked uh, Tobias if he could extend it and sort of puckify Mallory, um, and he was delighted too, and sort of brought in also references to Neuland and Fanfare. So this is Mallory with Puck on top, um, and quite interesting how they work. And the client was just sort of overwhelmed when they saw this sort of really badass, heavy <laughs> uh, lettering that could really be this new voice for theater at the Folger. So we're working on this now, and these are hypothetical posters, but we're really eager to kind of roll this out in its entirety. And we were really demonstrating the sort of hot and cold powerful and sort of monumental qualities of, of, the, of what this lettering can do for the institution. And we're also doing a new uh, series of editions. These are famous Folger editions of all of the plays. And uh, we presented them with a bunch of options. They were in favor of this one, which features some of the manuscripts from the Folger collection with his overlay of Mallory or of Puck, and then I call this my Boz Lerman version. Um, this was the other runner-up, and I think the first one will win, but we're still waiting to hear. Charismatic. So, <laughs> uh, this is our second category. Uh, can, can we describe typography as being charismatic? Uh, can we describe a typeface that would arouse loyalty or enthusiasm or have magnetic charm or appeal? Um, Last year, we started working with uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat's sisters, Janine and Lisanne, and his stepmother, Nora, uh, with a team from David Ajay's uh, architecture office uh, to develop an exhibition about Jean-Michel Basquiat uh, that has just opened here in New York at the Stair at Lehigh building. Um, so these are the sisters, incredible project, amazing to work with them. And um, just to show you a little context, I remember as a student at Cooper seeing that show at Mary Boone's gallery, and that is Janine with, uh, with him, with the artist, at the opening. I think what was significant was that the sisters really wanted this to feel completely different from the kinds of exhibitions that have been held at museums all over the world. Um, and that was a, appropriate. They wanted it to feel like a celebration and to tell the story of his life from the family's point of view. And uh, thinking about that sort of character of seriousness, but also being celebratory, I really thought and looked at this poster that was done for a show of jointly produced paintings by Warhol and Basquiat. I just love that quality of the sort of uh, power, but playfulness, and it's like commanding, but also celebratory. And I used this font called um, Lecturat by Florian Fecker, um, which seemed like a really great match for it. And the core of our kind of campaign was to use these incredible images of the artist and to use four of them from different phases of his life. So these were wheat pasted all over the city. And you know, part of this project was a really close coordination of graphics with the architecture in the, uh, that was done by Ajay's office. Um, so it's really built into the fabric of the uh, system within the exhibition. Uh, I highly encourage you to see the show. It's just a really joyful 
and a very special uh, environment. Several recreations are featured here. This one is of his studio at Great Jones Street. And uh, another one is a, a recreation of the Palladium nightclub that was on 14th Street. Uh, this is one of, where a couple of his enormous paintings are featured, complete with sort of 80s jumbotron installation. We also helped create wallpaper from the family's Brooklyn uh, townhouse uh, and uh, from photographs, uh, strictly from photographic sources. There was this one in the dining room, but also the living room had this crazy pattern on a couch. Um, and I really loved that pattern because it was actually totally cool. So I made it into a suit. <laughs> and that's Janine and Lisan at the opening. And they were doing opening remarks, and they hadn't seen me. And to see their faces as they saw me in the audience was, uh, was worth it. <laughs> Uh, the book is really beautiful. It's really approached like a kind of uh, scrapbook, collage, family album. Really features most of the text from the two sisters, which we set in different, slightly different colors of typewriter type. Um, it's just a really sweet book, very specific to this show, very much this blending of an homage and a kind of family portrait. Um, and the gift shop, of course, <laughs> was a, an opportunity for us to play around with creating t-shirts and graphics and fun stuff. Um, I suggested this name, and they really loved it because it's all kind of goofy and sort of um, sweet. And we also f suddenly at the very end were able to create chocolate for the event. <laughs> um, Performative. Um, so I'm going into my last bit here. <laughs> Performative uh, is really, for me, a way to talk about this project in Washington, D.C. Um, Studio Theater uh, was founded in 1978 and is on the corner of 14th and P Streets. And it rambles across, you know, three different buildings, and it has four distinct smallish theaters inside of it. I knew as we started this project that, as they were undergoing this renovation, that signage had to be really an important part of it. You had to kind of knit these several buildings together, but also be a fixture in the neighborhood. Um, I was really drawn to this typeface at the bottom right by my partner, Matt Willey, because it has this kind of funny, all across the 20th century character, but it also looks sort of projected or um, you know, made. It's sort of an interesting um, softness to it. Um, so. It has the um, spirit that I was after, and I'll show you just quickly to um, get into it. There is a dialogue between the sort of signage logo and then the sort of small type that says theater. And then we've started to really develop uh, the patterns of each theater um, that kind of are in the small lettering system that supports it. And that's sort of lead-ins and closers for their video promotion. Um, so the theater is bright yellow. We were photographing it a couple about a, a month ago, and a, as we were photographing, a woman got off the train or the bus in front of us and stopped with me and the photographer, and she said, "It's too yellow." <laughs> And it really slices out from inside the uh, sort of space of this corner. Um, what is really, what I can't show here is we've created all of this opportunity to do big posters all around the facade of the building. They weren't ready to show, they weren't ready to hang at that point. Uh, but we developed a lot of great kind of murals within to activate the space. Um, these are details. It's very full on in terms of the graphics living in the environment. I did a lot of these at real scale so that they didn't look just blown up from small things, but they really carried that quality. So these are some of the textures that I created with ink. And then you sort of see it b taking a pretty active role in kind of bringing people through the audience. Signage, a lot of stuff about the history of the theater uh, and the important actors and productions. And then quotes from different plays that are a part of one large mural. Again, the theater shapes was a kind of an icon for us. That was a donor wall, these are bags. And then posters, uh, suddenly I'm doing posters 
for a client that actually wants them, <laughs> which is a new thing for me. Um, and these are some of the productions uh, that have been uh, produced and uh, really interesting. There's, uh, many of these have been produced before, but they do a lot of original programming. And then this one is uh, for the upcoming season, a show about a group of people in Iran learning English. Uh, last piece, a little bit of a stretch, performative. Typefaces that actually perform. This is a font that I'm working on with Peter Balak that will, in real time, capture temperature, wind direction, and wind speed for a project that has just begun. And then a project that I did, again, another pandemic project, just to close with a really special one for the, uh, a group, a kind of collaborative group called Future Utopia. This was an album called 12 Questions. The illustrator that I worked with is Ori Tour, amazing. <laughs> What was great was Ori had never done animation, so we were, were able to work with a, a group called 1983 Animation Studio in LA. Um, there are 12 questions on the album and 12 stories embedded within the cover. And that's taken to logical extension with 12 different little uh, promotional campaigns. I'm curious, because to show mercy once in a blue moon only makes the unforgiving more furious as if kindness and grace were ethereal rare gifts in the realm of the luxurious, as if there was something hard and remote at the core of the human nucleus, despite compassion and tenderness making the darkest of souls almost perfectly luminous. I've sensed some creature not far from the surface, cold-blooded, imperious, with a heart like a cannonball lost in an ocean trench, stony, impervious, or lodestone lodged in the brain and locked on a bad star that brings out the worst in us. Look at me, God's gift to graffiti, spell checking, injurious. Look at you, joyriding the soft top hearse all the way to the terminus. Here we go, planting our poppies, then torching the forest, carelessly, serious. Meanwhile, we're crowding the brink of the lip, of the cusp, of the ring, of the next, Vesuvius, trying to flag down a passing planet or mothership failing to lip-read the universe. So I just want to clarify that that was the end of one of the videos with a poem read by the poet Simon Armitage. And um, I just love the way that the type performs to his voice in this project. Um, so thank you.